Want to start with that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. As hard as it is to imagine today, given the burgeoning population of the Sun Belt, back in the 1820s, the, the Sun Belt was Siberia for most Mexicans. It was not a place that one wished to go to. Mexico's population was static. It was about 7 million in 1810, and it remained 7 million up until the 1860s. The U.S. population, conversely, was increasing at a tremendous speed, both from natural increase and from immigration. So there is a kind of uneven demographics at work here where the population of the U.S. is, is spilling westward at an alarming rate from the point of view of Mexicans. And Mexico has really no people to export to its northern frontiers. So Texas, California, New Mexico, what is today Arizona, remained very sparsely populated. Great question. Let me see how I can do that one. As Anglo-Americans spilled over their frontier and moved west into Texas, the Texas being right nearby, absorbed a great many Anglo-Americans. It was a East Texas in particular was an attractive place to farm. Most Mexicans in Texas lived in San Antonio, kind of beyond the farm belt, and these two groups tended us to live in in separate spheres. Then, Mexican San Antonio, Anglo-American East Texas. New Mexico was not nearly so attractive for Anglo-Americans. Those who did come tended to be merchants, tended to be trappers, and they moved into Mexican communities. Taos was the, their principal uh, goal to settle in that remote mountain town where they would be far from Mexican officials, where they could smuggle and could uh, also have access to the Santa Fe Trail or access to the Southern Rockies. House was an ideal location then, and that was the, the number one home of Anglo-American expatriates who intermarried or lived with Mexican women, as the case might be, and who tended to learn Spanish because they were the minority, and they had to then accommodate to the majority. In Texas, of course, those Anglo-Americans didn't have to do that, settling apart as they did. With the opening of the Santa Fe trade, Santa Fe that had been the, the dead end on, a, on the Camino Real now became something of a border town, a crossing point. And as goods flowed into Santa Fe from the United States, Santa Fe being a small place, it absorbed them quickly. Those goods then started to move down the Chihuahua Trail, down to El Paso, to Chihuahua itself, and, and on to Durango, San Juan de los Lagos, uh, passing right on through the border town, but still making a great impact on it. Santa Fe, which then became also the terminus for silver moving north, for mules, for furs coming out of the Rockies, all of which would be shipped east to the United States. In the late colonial period, Spain had achieved a remarkable degree of peace with the Indian peoples who surrounded New Mexico, peace that was purchased in a way by giving Indians gifts, by trading with Indians, and stopping the making of war. Now, with the coming of Mexican independence, that those gifts began to decline, and peace began to unravel. And it began to unravel more severely because westward-moving Anglo-Americans did have something to offer to Indians, and that was guns, ammunition, and other trade goods. And the loyalties then that New Mexicans essentially had purchased from Indians began to be purchased away by Anglo-Americans who bid against the New Mexicans and outbid them, causing then those same, many of those same Indian groups now to make war on New Mexico rather than to make peace with New Mexicans. One of New Mexico's leading citizens during this time, the famous Padre Martinez of Taos, complained directly to Santana and to president, the president of Mexico, to Santana in 1843. That the, New that the New Mexicans were being pummeled by Indians because the Anglo-Americans were not only giving them guns and powder and ball, but alcohol, uh, luring Indians then to trade with them, making them more dependent on them, uh, 
with, with liquor. And some of that liquor, ironically, came from Taos itself, where Padre Martinez lived. Came from Americans who were operating illegal distilleries there and then shipping what came to be called Taos Lightning, which was an, an aguardiente, a, a, a hot water, a fire water, literally agua ardiente, aguardiente, up into the Rockies to trade with Indians. The furnishing of arms, ammunition, alcohol to Indians had a profound impact on their culture beginning back at the, on the, in the Atlantic coast and moving west. So this had, a long, this had a long history going back to the 17th century as Englishmen were offering these goods to, to Indians. And the alcohol in particular became uh, an addictive substance for which Indians would would work by hunting, by hunting in the southeast deer, bringing in deer skins. Later it would be beaver pelts, buffalo robes, and essentially farming, over farming their own, uh, their own grounds by bringing in excessive numbers of pelts and, and weakening their, their culture, as it were. So the Anglo-Americans, I think, contributed to that process. I'd not thought of that with New Mexico. Um, I mean, that I, in that context before, that's a good question because I've, I've thought of that a lot in Georgia, actually. Okay, let me let me put that in one context for you. That, um, a question you wouldn't think to ask, but I, uh, but I think you, it was implicit in one of the questions you gave me. And that was, what is the significance of all of this of this trade of the Santa Fe trade? The Santa Fe trade is of enormous significance regionally. That is, it connected the West, Missouri, which became a state, by the way, in 1821, the same year that Mexico became independent, connected Missouri to New Mexico, and then as the road to Santa Fe moved on to Chihuahua, it connected northern Mexico to the frontier region of the U.S. So in this broad region of the American West and Southwest, this was a major highway. On the other hand, if we look at the actual flow of goods over the trail, in no year does it amount to more than 5% of Mexico's imports. In the larger picture, then, the Santa Fe trade is really very much a, a local story. The Santa Fe Trail bridged two, two worlds. In large measure, it's the Anglo world and the Hispanic world, but in another way, it's really the frontier of Anglo-America with the frontier of Hispanic America, something that Anglo-Americans often looked, overlooked. They came into New Mexico and they looked around them and they said, my, isn't this place poor? Aren't these people poor? Forgetting that they were on the edge of Mexico, not in its core. And I would think that Hispanics coming over the trail from Santa Fe to Missouri might have responded very similarly, arriving at the town of Franklin and thinking, is this the United States? My, aren't these people poor? We like to think that Manifest Destiny is a force of the 1840s, that it began about the time of James K. Polk, and indeed the term was coined in 1844, the term Manifest Destiny. But Americans clearly subscribed to such a view in the early part of the century, and that notion that they had of that it was their destiny to move all the way to the Pacific was fed by early Anglo-Americans who came into places like New Mexico and on to California or Texas and saw that these areas were sparsely populated by Hispanics. Certainly they were still Indian territory and Americans knew what to do with that. That would be an area to conquer. Hispanics had not conquered Indians thoroughly in this region. It was an area that awaited conquest from the point of view of many Anglo-Americans, and those Anglo-Americans who came over the Santa Fe Trail and saw this firsthand gave enormously credible testimony then to their compatriots that here was a place that was not only sparsely populated, but it was ill-defended, that Mexicans had not built impressive fortifications, the place would fall easily. And of course, they were right. The Mexican War was enormously popular. We do, of course, call it the Mexican War, as if Mexico started it, even though it's quite clear that we started it. And it was enormously popular among all segments of, of the United States, all regions. Southerners wanted to expand the area of slavery. Westerners wanted new, new t lands. New Englanders wanted ports on the Pacific. 
And that the general sense of hubris that we had, that Mexicans were inferior, that we could therefore beat them easily, meant this would be uh, simply a, an easy little war. We could march off to the halls of Montezuma, young men could become heroes, return uh, to, to fight the first foreign war that America would ever have fought. We would be able to redeem, in a way, uh, American society, which had grown soft and complacent since the days of George Washington. This kind of rhetoric that was behind the war then made it, made it immensely popular. Certainly there was a minority uh, and a very eloquent minority who were opposed to it. The great historian Prescott thought it was idiocy. Prescott, who had written, ironically, the conquest of Mexico, which many soldiers took with them when they went off to the halls of Montezuma.